Hey, how you doing? My name is Pastor Yaku Shelley. I'm the senior pastor of the Hand of Lord International. And I'm here today to share with you our goal is to uh, strengthen your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to look at the sacrifice that he made for us. Uh, we mentioned uh, previously how as during this time of celebrating the resurrection that the church, the ecclesia, has went away from that. Uh, the enemy has came in and, and caused people to focus on uh, Easter eggs, hunts, and bunnies, and and all those different things, clothes, what type of hat you're wearing today. And it has absolutely nothing to do with the sacrifice of Christ. And before you leave today, my heart desire is to strengthen your faith in Christ and the sacrifice that he made for you. How are we going to do that? Well, the Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And we're going to use it as our foundational text, Hebrews uh, chapter 9, 11 through 22. But my goal is to show you that there were seven different places that Jesus shed his blood. Seven is the number of completion. Why is it so important that Jesus shed his blood for us? One of the things that we want to look at is that in the human body, there is between five to seven quarts of blood, which is about a gallon and a half. And think about if Jesus' blood is so precious that it's able to save anybody that ever exists. We've got billions of people that's on in the world right now, billions of people that have already lived before us. And just imagine that one drop, an uh, ounce of vapor of his blood is so precious that I can go before God and you can go before God. And even though we come to him as sinners, his blood pays our sin debt penalty. Watch this. As we look in uh, Hebrews, the right of Hebrews draws us to the connection of the New Testament and the, old, and the Old. We see the sacrifice of Christ being made, and we saw what God required. The fact that God is holy and he deals with sinful man, when the holiness of God meets the sinfulness of man, it produces divine wrath, meaning that God must judge all sin. If he was to refrain from doing so, he would violate his character. So we look at Hebrews uh, chapter 9, verse 11. It says, but Christ being and come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is to say not of this building neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered and once unto the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us for if the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of heifers sprinkling the unclean sanctified the to the purifier of the flesh, how much more, here's the kicker, shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God, purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For this cause, he is the mediator between the New Testament that by means of death and for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which were called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also be the necessity of the death, death of the testator. And a testament is the force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto, uh, enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. So we see, as we look at Hebrews chapter 9, 11 through 22, we see that in the Old Testament that they would, have, they would slay goats and bulls and lambs for the sin of other people. In other words, what would take place is, is that they would bring the animal and then the sinner would then place his hands on the animal, transferring his sins on the animal that were blameless. Once the animal died on behalf of that sinner, then that sinner was considered righteous. So it is with the, with the ultimate lamb who is the Lord Jesus Christ, that he now takes upon our sin, dies on our behalf, and because of his sacrifice, you and I are made righteous. Now this is what the, old the, the, the Hebrew writer brings us to the Old Testament and the New. And so what we're going to do, I'm going to show you that what Christ did, he took upon himself our sin. He dies on our behalf. He shed his own precious blood for you and me. By him doing that, 
we're made the righteousness of God. We're saved. Saved from what? Saved from pain and wrath. Now, seven is the number of completion. It, it, it would be amazing if we could point to a place where Christ did this one time. If he, he did it twice, it would be amazing. Three times would be beyond words. But I'm going to show you he did this seven times. So for those of you who question, well, you know, I don't believe in, in Jesus, you know, for whatever reason, your, your perspective, here's the thing that I want to introduce you to. Please explain to me how is it that if this was not a necessity, how is it that not only did he shed his blood for our transgression, but he did it seven different times, which points to the number of completion. There had to be a divine creator behind all of this. And so we see the sacrifice that Christ made. So as you go into this lesson today, I want to ask that you open your heart, get a pen and paper while you're listening. And I want you to follow with me as we look through the word of God, the seven places that Jesus shed his blood. The first place we want to look at is in Luke chapter 22. This is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Many of you are pretty much familiar with that, the Garden of Gethsemane. And that is where, what is known as the Mount of Olives, the oil press. And we, the oil, um, olives symbolic of the, the Holy Spirit uh, and its anointing. And we see that out of all the places to go, the Spirit of God led, leads Jesus right before he gets betrayed by Judas into the Garden of Gethsemane. And according to Luke 22, beginning at verse 39 through uh, 44, it says, And he came out and went as was what? Unto the Mount of Olives. His disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone cast, kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. So the first place we want to look at that Jesus shed his blood was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus now is about to take upon him the responsibility to, to save mankind. He has already lived at this point 33 and a half years. We talk about his death, burial, and resurrection, but we also got to look at for a minute his life. Had he sinned, he would have forfeited being our sacrificial lamb. He had to be the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world, but he had to be without blemish, tying us back to what we just shared with the Old Testament. So here we see Jesus living a, a, a sinless life. He comes to the garden and he asks God, can you remove this cup? What's interesting about that cup, he's referring to the cup of sin. So what G Jesus understood that he had to take upon my sin and your sin. Here's the issue. He takes upon our sin. Now sin separates us from God. And so at this very moment, this is the first time the son is being separated from the father. He makes the declaration, can this cup be passed? Can we go another route? So we see the humanity of Christ right now, not his divinity that's being exemplified, but his humanity is saying, can we go another route? And then many of you are going through things in life, and many times you ask God, can we go another route? I don't like the way things are going. Well, look at this. He says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. The ultimate place of submission. Submission is when you don't want to do something, but you yield to it in a way. And so what he does is says, my will is for this cup to be passed, but nevertheless, I'm going to choose your will. And at this moment, we see in verse 44 that the Bible says that in great agony. And, and what happens in verse 44 is this uh, medical ph phenomenon known as hemohydrosis. When a person reaches this place of agony that, they, that now, instead of just sweating, they sweat, capillaries begin to bust, and sweat and blood both comes out at the same time. So the first place we see Jesus shedding his blood is in the garden. And get, here's what he does. He breaks the bondage of our will, what is known as willpower. So God gave us a will. He didn't make us robots. We have the power to choose. 
So the first place Jesus shed his blood is, is, is where we are all the time. Before you can do his will, you must choose not your will, but thine will be done. In other words, I'm going to submit to you. Everything about me is telling me not to, but I'm going to submit to you. So the first place that God shed his blood for us so that you and I can have power is in our will. We have to choose to serve him. It's amazing when I see people talk about what other people have done to them. That's why they are not serving and, and, and these conditions are not perfect. That's why they haven't yielded their heart. And if God wanted me to stop doing this and stop doing that, then he would make me know you, you have a will. He gives you the power to choose. Now, here's the amazing thing that if you do not exercise your will and God do it for you, how can he reward you? He didn't make you a robot. It's nothing like love and obedience. In other words, the scripture tells us again that if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. In other words, he says, if you love me, it's not just through lip service, but I want you to exemplify it by exalt using your will to choose to do my will for you. And so here's what God does. The first place he starts us with out of everything he could, he said, here's the thing. You're going to have an issue with choosing his will over your own. You're going to have a lot of temptation in this world. Matter of fact, it, it amazes me when, when people speak over other people's lives and all they tell them is good and wonderful stuff. And we've done a, a disservice to people to make them think that if you choose the will of God, all these great things should ha be happening to you. And the moment that they don't, then we say, well, what's the point? I don't want to do this anymore. It's because your will haven't been broken. What we're doing is synchronizing our old lifestyle with the new, and we're willing to do whatever we want to. In other words, come to God as you are, which is true. But the problem is we're, we are called to be conformed to the image of his son. There are some changes that's going to have to take place. There's some things my flesh is going to want to do, but the, the word is going to tell me I can't do it. And I have to choose his will, which is his word, over what my flesh wants to do. Guess what? God knew you and I were going to have that issue. So guess what he did? The first place that he shed his blood to give us victory is in our willpower. Is at the garden that he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. May God give you the strength and the power to believe in him right now to use your will to conquer whatever it is that's fighting against God's will in your life. The second place we want to look at will be found in Isaiah uh, chapter 53, we want to start at verse 2. And the Bible declares, he says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form of comeliness. And when they shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Verse 3 says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities, and a chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every man to his own way. And the Lord have laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before the shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. And for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, even thou, even thou. Thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. We look at this in Isaiah 53, 2 through 10. We see the second place that Jesus shed his blood, and the Bible says that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. When we go up, go up to the top of, of 3 and 4, it talks about uh, that he was bruised. When we look at being bruised, bruised is bleeding, but it's under the skin. 
Notice out of all the things that God could talk about right now, we see that verse 2 says that he would be plucked out. Verse 3 says he's despised and rejected of men. Verse 4 says he, he bore our griefs and sorrows and God afflicted him. And verse 5 says he was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquity. And, and what's amazing with, with this, when I look at him being bruised, I see that this represents our internal healing. I never really paid attention to this as much as I have this year as I, I recognize that one of the major hangups with people is being rejected of men. That rejection and the fear of rejection grabs men and, and it, it keeps them from moving forward into the things that God has ordained. But according to Isaiah 53, he was bruised. He, 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 he bruised, bleed internally, which represents our internal healing. That when we are rejected of men, that's a, something that's going on on the inside. So whoever is listening to this and you got struggles going on on the inside, of you that people don't know about. Most of the times when we are offended or rejected by men, our feelings are hurt. We may have a disposition on the outside and someone who knows us may be able to pick up that we're hurting. But the truth of the matter, how many times we've been through things and on the inside we got things going on. And, and here's the amazing part about being bruised, especially emotionally. If I, you and I get into a fight and, and I hit you and you hit me and I black your eye, you black mine, we could go to the mirror every day and look and see how fast that healing process is taking place. But when we are scarred emotionally, the sad part is whatever we go on with us physically on the outside doesn't mean that we're healed on the inside. So I can be uh, bu bruised emotionally when I'm eight years old, but when I'm 38, I, I still act a certain way because I never got the healing that was necessary. Matter of fact, when it's time for that healing to take place, I run from it or, or I can act, I get angry or I throw things or, or I, I cuss people out or, or I, I, I distance myself from them. See, the, see the thing that, that I love about this particular text is that God suffered so that I could get internal healing. Can I help you with something? That you may be struggling with internal healing right now and the person that you believe did you wrong may never tell you they're sorry. So what if they don't tell me that they apologize. Does that mean I'll be stuck? What if the person that, that, that wounds me dies before I can even fix the problem? Does that mean that I'm stuck? Not at all. Here's why. Because according to Isaiah 53, he was bruised. It says it said that, that it pleased God to bruise him. In other words, here's what he knew. That when Christ stood in my stead, it pleased the father to bruise his son. Not that he was an abusive father, but he was so loving that he bruised his son so that, he, that I can go to him. When I got stuff going on on the inside and there's nobody else around me who understands that while I'm praying and saying, God, I need you to help this in, internal pain and struggle that I have. He says, you know what? If you, if you understand Isaiah 53 and what my son did for you, he was bruised for that. He bled internally under the skin. No one could see the bleeding, but they may see the evidence of the bleeding. My son endured it. It says that he re rejected a man. Let me tell you something. You may say, well, the reason I don't go to church is because they act like this to me. Well, as long as you deal with people, you're going to you stand a chance to be rejected. So let's get over that. The moment somebody don't do what you think they should do, your feelings can get hurt. So let's get over that. I'm not telling you that your feelings are obsolete. What I'm telling you is, at what point are you going to take the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and begin to trust the fact that he knew your feelings were going to get hurt? Not, not only did he know that your feelings were going to get hurt by people, he knew that you was going to hurt somebody's feelings too. So it doesn't matter whether I'm the one who did the pain, the, the, the hurt or the pain or the disappointment or the one that received it. Here's, here's what I love about the text. It tells me that he was bruised for my iniquity. It pleased the Father to bruise him. He bled internally so that every internal conflict that I have, that you have, anybody that you know, at some point, when are we going to trust the word of God? Especially those of us who claim to be mature. At some point, we got to trust the word of God to bring healing to us. It would be great if everybody that did you wrong would come back and tell you they're sorry. But just in case they don't, he was bruised for our iniquity. The Bible says that he was rejected of men. How do we know you're growing? is that when you sacrifice for someone, you give up for someone, and they can't appreciate your sacrifice, reject you. I can prove to you there's 12 different points that I can make to show you how the trial of Jesus was unfair. 
at this point, he's being taken from one place. And here's what I love about this scripture, too. It says in verse 8 that he was taken from prison and from judgment. How can Isaiah write this back then and Jesus carry it out because his life was not his own? He had already said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. So you mean to tell me that God can put me in a situation people can lie on me? Absolutely. My wife was sharing with me earlier this week that she had a dream that someone was assassinating her character. And every time that she tried to vindicate herself, she would look wrong. <laughs> How do I know I'm in the perfect will of God? Because you have to go through things where people lie on you and they say different things about you. Because Jesus is going through a trial right now and people are making up stuff as they go. And watch this. He's like a lamb. Before the, shit, the slaughter, he's not able to say a word. There are times in your life that you're going to go through suffering. Watch this. And God won't let you defend yourself. And, and you feel like your feelings are being hurt over and over again. Hey, here's what I'm trying to help you understand. He was bruised for your iniquity. He was bruised for that internal pain. May God heal you from every internal hurt that you go through, that you've been through th throughout your whole life. May he heal you from every hurt that you're going to go through in this next season. May he heal you from every hurt that you go through in the future. I thank God that he loved me enough that he bruised his son. That no matter what I go through that may bring a tear to my eye in the middle of the night when no one understands. I have a God who understands me because he was bruised for my iniquity. May God heal every internal hurt that you have had, will have, and having right now in Jesus' name. Point number three will be found in Matthew uh, chapter 27. I'm going to read verse 26. Just this verse alone uh, brings so much. I'm just going to read this. And it says, And then release he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scorned Jesus, they delivered him to be crucified. Small verse, but so much inside of this verse. To catch you up to speed, what took place is that by this time, uh, the same people that was telling Jesus, Hosanna, at the beginning of the week, now has said, crucify him before Pilate. Pilate was a governor of Rome, and it was up to him to govern the areas that Rome uh, had. And one of the things that's amazing, I also want to include in this, the Bible says Jesus came in the fullness of time. At this very time that Rome was the world power, Rome did something very interesting, similar to what the Holy Spirit did. When previous... Uh, places would take over certain areas. They would take the people from that land and ship them back to where they came from. But, but what the Romans would do, Romans would conquer an area, put a governor in that area to change the mindset of the people. Notice out all the time that Jesus came, he came while Rome was in power, and Rome was exemplifying the very thing that the Holy Spirit does. When you and I give our life to the Lord Jesus Christ, he doesn't take us out of this world and we go to heaven the moment we confess. No, instead, he gives us the Holy Spirit that now sits in us to change us to the culture of God. Here, the people had an opportunity to bring Jesus before Pilate. And because of their custom, they could release a prisoner. Pilate understood that what they was doing to Jesus wasn't right, but he was also trying to do his job. And because the re religious leaders really wanted Jesus to be put to death, but Pilate could not just uh, kill Jesus because of religious matters. So he tried to put it back on the people and say, OK, here you have Barabbas, who's a murderer. Here you have Jesus, who seems as if he hasn't done anything. And Pilate is hoping that they really choose Jesus, but he's trying to do his job at the same time. Have you ever been in a situation where you be conflict by the things that you really believe in and things that people want? He gives them the opportunity to choose between Barabbas and Jesus. And they said, give us Barabbas. Now, these are the same people that just said to Jesus that, oh, Hosanna on the highest as he's coming into the city. They are telling him how great he is. Less than a week later, they are telling him, crucify him. Pilate is at a dilemma. So they choose Barabbas. He releases Barabbas. But Jesus is still having to be punished. So what he does is sentence Jesus to be scourged. Many of you who don't know the background of scourging, you will find out that, that the Romans are doing this at this time, but it has really uh, been perfected by the Persians. And what they would do is they would assign uh, soldiers who would actually learn the technique of scourging. Uh, these individuals would... Uh, have what was known as a cat of nine tails that was a whip that was made of leather, 
thongs. Inside of the thongs would be sheep bone and metal and 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 it was caused, it, it was set to inflict pain. And they had believed that if a person was hit 39 times, they would be hit one struck. Uh, hit away from losing their life. So they would have a person on the side known as a counter who would count the stripes or, or the, the, the hits that everyone would take. These pre people who were in charge of scourging also was trained enough to where they knew how to flick their wrist whereby allowing the, the metal and the sheep bone to enter inside your flesh but also rip your flesh apart with their hits. So now we see this innocent lamb taken before the slaughter we just covered in Isaiah, he's not able to, to defend himself. Imagine them ripping his clothes off, exposing his back to the person that was trained in the art of scourging. Not able to get away, not able to defend himself. They take the whip with bones and sheep metal in it and sheep bones and metal in it and begin to prepare themselves as they're about to hit him. But the thing that I love about Jesus is that he had already knew he, must, he is the word made flesh, and he already knew that he had to take upon ourselves his, our, upon himself our sin, and now he's about to endure these stripes, and, and he's about to be, be whipped. Now, here's the thing that I love, that when he's about to be hit, he knows that the counter has to stop at 39, he knows that by the time that I would be alive, that there were 39 major diseases that when you study the medical uh, industry, you find out that there's different strands of different things, but they, they have reduced that, that there are 39 major diseases. And according to uh, Isaiah 53, we just read, it says, by his stripes, I'm healed. <laughs> so every stripe that Jesus is about to take represents my healing. So imagine him not being able to go anywhere, and now the person who has been skilled, who has been trained to do this, takes back the whip, and he now slashes across his back. And Jesus feels every pain, but he endures this 39 times, and the Bible says plus one, so that when you and I go to the doctor, and the doctor tell you that you, know, you have a disease, your body is not functioning in its proper place, also known as perversion, which means to deviate from God's original intent, that the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, they were given pro perfect bodies, but the moment that they sinned and allowed sin in, God says, thou shalt surely die. Spiritually, we would die because sin separate us from God, but I believe that God never intended us to die. But because of sin, my body breaks down. The things that I used to do, I can't do anymore. I'm only 44 years old, but I can't move like I did when I was 18. I, can't, I, I did some work yesterday, and, and right now as I'm talking to you, I can feel it in my back. I can feel it in my legs. I can feel it in my shoulders. I can feel it in my arms. Why? Because my body is dying. We're facing a dilemma now, a pandemic, that people are catching what is known as coronavirus, and it's it affecting people's respiratory system. And there are some people right now that are listening, and, and you may have a loved one, or you yourself may be going through something in your body. You may have fear that that disease is about to overtake you. Here's the thing that I want you to understand, that because of this sacrifice that he made for us, you and I can hear the doctors tell us what's wrong with us, and, and but we can say, doctor, I hear what you're saying. Thank you for the medical uh, prognosis, but I believe that by his stripes I'm healed. A doctor who don't believe in Christ may look at you as being foolish, but because of his word, you're saying, God, you endure the cat of nine tails. You endure it, scourge. In other words, here's why I want you to understand. This is what this third place did. It, it allowed you and I to have a, a, our bodily healing. That no matter what goes on in your body, whether you, whether you, you have a, a pain in your pinky toe or the, Bible, the, the doctor tells you that your brain has cancer, you can go to him for healing. There's nothing that my body can go through that I can't go back to the cross and the sacrifice of Christ and say, you know what, you shed your blood 39 times plus one. I believe that plus one is for anything that may come along later on in life that they may come up with and say, you know what, here's something else that the human body cannot fight off. I can go to his word and say, but Lord, you endured this for me. By your stripes, I am here. We were here. So that means healing doesn't take place at the moment that I ask. Healing's already made available to me. Lord, thank you for being scourged. Thank you for the people turning on you. Thank you for enduring every hit, every dilemma, 
Thank you for bleeding so that I can come to you with any hurt, pain, or disappointment my body goes through, that I can stand in the middle of the doctor's room. I can stand while, my, while I'm going through surgery and my family can be on the outside in the waiting room. It's by your stripes. Healing is already made available to me because if I accepted you, I accepted your sacrifice. Thank you for healing every part of my body from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. I'm covered under your precious blood that you shared as you were scourged for my body to heal it. Thank you for your sacrifice in Jesus' name. The fourth place we want to look at, we want to continue in Matthew 27. Matter of fact, we'll pick up at the next verse, verse 27. And here's what it reads. It says, And then the soldiers of the, of the governor took Jesus into the common hall, and they gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And if another book says uh, uh, purple. And, and when they had planted a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and, and took the reed and smote him on the head. So this next place that Jesus shed his blood was with the crown of thorns. We see in Matthew 27, 27 through 30, that after they scourge him, imagine his body is, is ripped to shreds through the, being scourged with the cat of nine tails. They drag him and put a robe over him. And, and one book says scarlet, which is red. And another uh, gospel, it says purple. It's safe to say that if it's scarlet, it represents the blood. And if it's purple, it represents royalty. I, I can't really tell you which one it was, but either or had divine representation we see that they now mock him and they put a crown of thorns and if you study the crown of thorns that the thorns would be anywhere from seven to ten inches long not only they place him on his head but they took the reed they put in his hand to mock him as being a king and they hit him across the head allowing the thorns to now pierce inside of his head they are mocking him at the same time God, why did you shed your blood for us with the crown of thorns? I believe that this place gives you and I the ability to stand in agreement of mental healing. One of the things that we want to draw away from is the fact that people struggle in their mental. Matter of fact, I recognize that the, the enemy's main place of warfare is in your mind. Have you ever found yourself being worried about something that never happened? Have you ever thought that something was one way only to find out later that it wasn't? Have you ever thought that you was about to lose your home and you, you stressed and you worried, thought that they, they were about to repo your car? You, you thought that, that maybe when your child left out the house, you had an uneasy feeling and you stayed up and you anticipated them coming back home. Notice that, that during this time is mental. Well, I thank God that he endured the crown of thorns, that as his, the thorns were piercing his skull, he was bringing deliverance for me that when I find myself under mental pressure, that I can go to him and say, Lord, I, I control my mind. Give me the mind of Christ right now. Every thought and every imagination, every high thing that is all itself against the knowledge of Christ, I cast down. I, I declare, give me the mind of Christ right now. Here's the thing. Here's what you're holding on. And I want to include this. Lord, you endured the crown of thorns. You bled for my mental health. If my liver, if I can have liver disease, if I can have kitten dis disease, if I can have heart disease, I truly believe someone can have brain disease. I believe that your brain could also suffer, and as a result of that suffering, you can go through mental unbalances. We don't want to talk about that, but the truth of the matter is everybody in some form, whether you are driving the most expensive car or whether you're walking and catching a bus, everybody go through mental turmoil at some point or another. And those who claim that they don't are lying to you. Well, regardless of whether I want to acknowledge it or not, the truth of the matter is I have the right for healing over my mental state. Why? Because the Lord Jesus Christ endured the crown of thorns. Thank you for shedding your blood so that I can have a healthy mind in Jesus' name. The fifth and the sixth place we're going to look at, and we're going to continue in Matthew 27, and we're just going to pick up at verse 33. It says, and when they were come, unto the place of Golgotha, that it is to say a place of a skull that gave him vinegar to drink 
mingle with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. The prophet was quoting, they were quoting here uh, Psalms 22 and 18. But as they are now crucifying him, they are uh, putting him on what we know as the cross. And as they are pinning him down on the cross, they are driving nails uh, through his feet and piercing uh, a particular median nerve and, and overlapping his feet together. Because what they are about to do is they are about to lift him up. And so now they must hold his body weight. So they are piercing his feet. And at the same time, they are piercing his hands. And many people, when they think about his feet were being pierced and his hands are being pierced, I want to just help you to understand something. As we look at the hand piece, the hand is not right here in the middle of his, his palm. According to their custom, the hand was considered all the way down to, to here, around somewhere where you would wear your watch. If they would pierce him here, it's considered his palm, they would then shatter his bones. And the issue with that would be, Scripture tells us not one bone in his body was broken. And if they was to pierce him here and hang him up, his body weight would cause him to rip his hand apart and the person who was being crucified would then fall off. But if they pierced him here, it would hold his body weight. So it wasn't here in his palm, it was here at his wrist. So imagine Jesus being placed on the cross. Now he has to hold his body weight up. And every time he moves, he's in a position where he's about to suffocate because of the position that they have him in. He's been scorned. He has the crown of thorn on his head. He's, he's been beat beyond recognition, as we read in Isaiah 53, that they didn't see anything about him that, that would make them want him or, or, or his beauty was not there. By this time, he's beat beyond recognition. It's not a pretty sight. He doesn't just have a black eye. His face is swole. If you did not know him before now, you could not recognize him. So he's, he's already endured uh, the crown of thorns, he endured being scored, so he's, he's bleeding from his back and his buttocks and the back of his legs, and that is being scraped on this wooden cross, and now he's being nailed to the cross to hold his body. The thing that I find out that's also amazing, that if you study the nerves that they would uh, uh, attempt to nail, that any time he moved or twist or turn, it would cause fire to shoot out through his body. And so I, I believe that in this, that he endured fire in his body so that you and I don't have to go to hell. Somebody once asked me, Pastor Shell, I don't believe that God, that there's a hell, because how could a loving God let anyone go to hell? Here's the thing I need you to see. If you study scripture, you can find out that hell was never meant for us. It was meant for Satan, Lucifer, and all those that followed him. So in other words, here's what takes place, that whoever you choose to follow in time will be who you follow in eternity. Well, my God endured the cross. That fire shot through his body every time he moved, so he endured hell for me. We go further. Your feet represents your walk or your lifestyle. He bled so that my lifestyle can get back on track. I don't know about you, but I've done some things I'm not proud of that I hope to never do again. But through his sacrifice and allowing the nails to be put in his feet, it represented my life, my walk, my lifestyle. That moving forward, I can walk in the, in, in the grace of God. I can do what he called me to do. I can fulfill what he called me to fulfill. And even as I'm doing this now or as I was preparing, my thought came into, Lord, at one point in my life, I was disqualified. Not because I didn't have the gifts or the talent or the call. I was disqualified because my lifestyle didn't meet. When he endured the nails in his hand, it represents my work, the stuff that I do, the stuff that I put my hands to. <laughs> Lord, I thank you for bleeding that you can change my lifestyles, change my desires, my motivations, the stuff I used to do I don't want to do no more. The things that I've done that, that wasn't pleasing to you, thank you for bleeding that you're able to wash away my sins and I can start doing your will. I thank God that his word also tell us that whatever we shall do for Christ shall last. Uh, there's some people that's watching this right now. 
it's time for you to get on your job. It's time for you to labor in the house. It's time for you to, to do those things that God called you to do, to walk according to what God has walked in. Here's the thing. He sacrificed for you and me that my lifestyle can change. I don't care what you was addicted to before now. That addiction can be broken. Your life can change. I don't care how well uh, 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 you felt as a dad or as a mom or whatever you did in life that wasn't pleasing. He can change your lifestyle. What about the stuff that you put your hands to do that you shouldn't do? He can change that too. He bled so that your lifestyle can change in his feet. He bled so that the things that you have put your hands to can change with his hands. May the sacrifice of Christ flow over into your lifestyle and with everything that you touch from this point over. Why? Because he bled for you fifth and sixth place so that your lifestyle and your works can change. May it happen for you in Jesus' name. The last place we want to draw our attention to place number seven, we will find it in St. John chapter 19, beginning at verse 31. And it says, the Jews, therefore, because it was preparation that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day, excuse me, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other that was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. Well, they didn't know that they was actually fulfilling scripture where it says again, like I mentioned before, not a bone of his body would be broken. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he knoweth that he says true, that he might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture might be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture said, they shall look on him whom they pierce. So we look at now the bone shall be broken. You find that in Exodus 12, 46. You see in Numbers 9 and 12 and Psalms 34 and 20. And they shall look upon him in whom they pierce is in Zechariah 12, 10 and Revelations 1 and 7. Here we see that Jesus now on the cross, he has given up the ghost. He has, he has died. And what they would do is break the legs of those who were being crucified to make sure that they were dead. And as, when they get to Jesus, do the other, as the Bible says in, 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 in Isaiah 53, that he will be uh, numbered among transgressors. So he, he's put between two thieves. They were there because they had violated. He's there because he was innocent. But he took upon our sins, which made him guilty. They break their legs to make sure they're dead. But when they get to him, somebody say, for whatever reason, but it was the will of God that they do not touch him. But instead, a soldier who was also trained in the art of war, knew how to know which, which place in a person's side to stab them with a spear. They had been trained on this. And as he stabbed him, he, it is proven that from a medical perspective, he, he stabs him in the heart, and he also stabs the sack around the heart that now blood and water, clear fluid comes out, which represents the sacrifice of Christ and his baptism. Here's what's amazing in this seventh place that we look at, that he was pierced in his side. Watch this. His heart was pierced. Out of all the places to be pierced, the Romans learned the art of piercing for war. But this soldier who was taught to pierce in the right place to pierce your heart now has the opportunity to pierce the heart of Christ for me, for you. Out of all the places that he's pierced, he's pierced not in his chest to his heart, but from his side. That may not mean anything to you unless you read the Bible. As you see in Genesis that when God chose to bring Eve into existence, he pulls Eve from a rib, the side of Adam, presents her to Adam, and Adam says, you are one man because you come from me. You are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So the seventh place that Jesus shed his blood, he was piercing his side. But for what reason? For the purpose of a relationship. Not just a relationship, a marriage between him and us, that we are those of us who receive Christ as Savior, 
The Bible calls us his bride. He is known as the bridegroom. So he, we just don't serve a God that we just worship and everything is about him. He brings us to this place of relationship, reciprocation. I love on you, you love on me back. It, and here's how he shows us. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So those of you who are wrestling with the idea of really choosing him and doing his will, here's the thing. It, it, it's going to matter one day. It's going to make sense one day. Just keep the course. Stay consistent. Because God's going to ask you to do so because you're married to him that other people who are not married just won't understand. But guess what? He shed his blood in this last place for the purpose of marriage, for the purpose of this relationship. I can entertain this God who entertains me back. I can speak to this God who speaks to me back. I can love on this God who loves me back. I can call him my husband. Whether I'm male or female, he is my husband. So the, purpose, the, 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 the function of a husband is to make sure that everything that his wife has, his, his wife needs, she has. So that means everything that I stand in need of and every part of my being, he's accountable for. Because not only is he my God, he's my spouse. And the last place that he shed his blood was in his side to represent a relationship and a marriage between him and me, between you and him. We thank God for his sacrifice of being pierced in his side, the seventh and the last place for the purpose of relationship. When Jesus died, it's proven that those that was inside the temple of Solomon, that they had curtain that separated the holy place and the holes of holies. Only the high priest could go in there. If you study that, you would find out that this, this curtain could be anywhere from 20 to 30 feet high. Here's the thing that happened that, that is history proves. That at the moment that he died, there was an earthquake. And those religious leaders who wanted him killed also came back to testify that the veil of the temple was rent, meaning it was ripped apart. It says, watch this, from the top to the bottom, which shows that it had to be the hand of God that ripped the veil. Jesus' body was the veil. The moment that he died, he opened up unto me and you, having access to the Father. So the fact that it was rent from the top to the bottom shows that it had to be the hand of God because no human could rip the veil 30 feet in the air on down. Why was the veil rent? Because prior to then, only a certain group of people could come before God. But at the moment that the veil was rent, he gave access for you and for me, no matter if I'm just coming in today or I've been doing this for 30 years, all of us can approach him and have a one-on-one -on -one special relationship with God. Now, I'm not saying that because I can have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God that church is not necessary. No, church is very much necessary. Matter of fact, the Bible says that he will give you pastors after his own heart that will feed the people. I'm not saying that you can't have a relationship with God one-on-one. -on -one. You can absolutely have a relationship with God one-on-one. -on -one. But he has, he has came up with a structure. He has already done something in the heart of a person, and then he now gives them the ability to talk to you just as I'm doing right now. At one point in my life, because of my lifestyle, I could not talk to you. Why? Because I didn't have this relationship that I'm telling you about. Well, somebody is listening to me now. Here's what I'm, I'm seeking to do. I'm seeking to bring you into this place of relationship. I want to invite you to this marriage. There's a God who gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here's the thing. You may look at you giving your life to God as all the stuff that you're going to have to stop doing. You want to know why that's a wrestle? That's a wrestle with you because those things are God's in your life. God is a universal word. Whatever's first in your life, that's your God. Here's the thing. I'm asking you to change God's today. I know it's hard. I'm asking you to, here's the thing, whatever's your God, whatever's first in your life, let me ask you this, has it sacrificed the way that I just shared? That person that you lay down with every day. If you wake up thinking about them, going to bed thinking about them, go throughout your day thinking about them, it's a strong possibility they're your God. Let me ask you, that person that, that you have given your whole life over to, the person that you're living with, that you're not married to, have, have they shared their blood for you seven different places like this God I'm telling you about? The Bible says that we would be lucky if one person would, would desire to die for us, much less do it. The God I'm telling you about, he died for you. He died that you may have eternal life. You may not believe this, but here's the thing. A lot of things in life we can be wrong about, but here's the thing. It, once you die, it's over. So let's say you, say you believe that I can just live however I want to. This life that I'm, I have is mine, and, and you're going to die one day, no matter how much you, you, you 
eat right, no matter how much you exercise, you're going to die. You're going to slip from time to eternity. Here's my thing I want to say to you. You better be right. You better be right that it doesn't take all of this. You better be right that you don't have to believe in a God that you don't see. You better be right that you don't want to believe in the Bible. You better be right. Because there's a heavy price to pay to be wrong. I can leave out of here today and go and get me something to eat. And if I don't like what I've eaten, I don't have to go back to the restaurant no more. It costs me $15, $20. No big deal. I get the $15, $20 back. But if I play about salvation, if I play about my eternal state, that's a heavy price to pay to be wrong. I'm talking to that person right now. Everything in you is raging because I'm destroying your gods. I'm destroying your lack of commitment to the one and only wise, true God. I'm removing your excuses. Right where you are, I'm asking you to make a declaration. I'm asking you to make a commitment right where you are. Before you've had this opportunity, you say, well, I don't want people looking at me in church. Uh, well, the Bible says if you uh, are afraid to confess him in front of men, he will not confess you in front of his, his father. Anytime you're given an opportunity to make a declaration that the Lord Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, God, it's, it's imperative that you do so. God loved you so much that he allowed me to prepare this. I've been teaching on this for over 10 years. But he loved you enough that he knew at this moment I would be talking to you. My brother, my sister, here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking that person that, that probably believe once saved is always saved. I disagree with that. I believe that once we come to Christ, we marry him. But just as I'm married to my wife, I can violate those marriage, that marriage vow. And if so doing, she has the right to divorce me. Or tell me that we have to start over again. There's somebody that's listening to me now. You have not been who God wanted you to be. You strayed away. For whatever reason, I'm not even concerned about that. Here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to follow me right now. As the Bible tells us real simply, according to the epistle of John, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the first thing I want you to do right where you are, I just want you to just lift your hands. You remember my talk, talk before that your hands represent your work? So when you lift your hands, that's a sign of surrender. You, you're saying, God, I give up. I, I present to you everything I've done. When you lift your hands before God, you're saying, look, look at my hands. Everything I've done, no matter how blood stained, if I've done something, I touched somebody I shouldn't have touched, fought somebody I shouldn't have fought, molested somebody I shouldn't have molested, I stole them from someone, I'm bringing it all before you. Can you forgive me? And that right where you are, I want you to ask God, forgive me for every sin I've ever committed, known, unknown, the things I forgot about, the things that's on the forefront of my mind. Can you forgive me now? Listen, he shed his blood in several different places so he, he could forgive you. The Bible says we confess our sins. He is faithful and just forgive us of our sins. Watch this. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's what God's going to do. Right where, as you're confessing, he's wiping your slate clean. This, how, this is so amazing of his blood. Now watch this. I said at the beginning. That a, that a blood inside of a human body on the average is between five to seven quarts of blood. His blood is so precious that he did this one time, one day. And at the end, when they pierced him in his side, imagine the remainder of the blood that was left coming out. That was enough to pay the sin debt penalty for all of mankind. Those who we're not born yet, you and me, those that were born at that time, and those who went before Christ. So if you were to take seven quarts of anything, and you have it in front of you, and you say, you know what, this whole seven quarts has to be used for, every, for everybody that will ever exist. And what if you had to ration that out? My mind can't even fathom how much of that seven quarts could be used just for me. How much is it for you? Maybe a sprinkle. Maybe out of that sprinkle, each sprinkle represented me, you. That's how precious that blood is. Well, according to Romans 10, the Bible says we confess the Lord Jesus Christ with our mouth. And believe in our heart, we shall be saved. But with the heart, man, believe it unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to follow me with this. I'm not where you are. So I'm depending upon you to just follow what I'm asking. Two things I'm asking out of you. Number one, I'm going to lead you through a prayer. I want you to believe in your heart. 
And I want you to repeat after me. With the heart, man believing unto righteousness. righteousness. With the mouth, com confession is made unto salvation. Do those two things. Here we go. As your hands are lifted, as your heart is open, just repeat after me. Lord God, I come to you now, a sinner in need of a Savior. I believe that you sent your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. I believe that he shed his blood for me in seven different places. I believe that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, there is no forgiveness. I believe that as I'm re repenting now, you're forgiving me. I give you my heart. I give you my mind. I give you my will. Your will for my life is what I want to do. Right now, I'm asking you to take me. I want you to make me. I'm asking you to keep me. And I'm asking you to use me for your glory. Every life that's attached to mine, use me, Lord, to draw their hearts back to you. If you said that prayer with me, the Bible says if one come back to God, angels in heaven are rejoicing. I don't care when you have done this. I don't care what the date says. All I'm happy is that God has given me the opportunity to share with you that you can come back to him. Hey, if you said this prayer with me, you're married right now. You may be single and you've been asking God, Lord, when am I going to get married? Guess what? Today is the day. You just got married. Now, he may send someone else along in your life to add to what he's already doing, but today you're married. And the fact that you're married, here's what I'm asking you to do. Keep that covenant. Keep your commitment. Begin to live a life as a married person. You may not have someone on your arm. You may not have someone walk, holding your hand. You may not have someone that's sleeping next to you. But there's a God that you just married. Stay faithful to that commitment. Find you a local church that's believing into the things of God. The Bible is their governing authority. And I want you to open your heart and allow God to use you, as you said in this prayer. It's more than just you. Remember I talked about before? That if it was just about us getting to heaven, I think that God will, the moment we accept him, he would take us home. But he don't. He did what the Romans do. He would give you the Holy Spirit to change you while you're still here on earth to expand his kingdom. May God bless you. May he enrich you. I'm glad that you have made a decision to come back to the body of Christ for those of you who have. May his kingdom continue to grow. And may he fulfill his assignment in your life, the reason that you were born and the reason that he shed his blood in seven different places for you and for me. May God bless you and enrich you in Jesus' name.